gorgeous day here in Port Arthur. Uh, 1st of May 2021. Um, where do I start? Yeah, I was just thinking of this idea of imagining in camera courts being held on camera through Zoom in this COVID time with the DAO recordings, that's the digital audio recordings, which are supposed to <clears throat> be part of the modernization of the courts dating back start of this millennium. Imagine more modernization starting at the millennium. And the question is whether the, <clears throat> so we've got in camera, which means secret, on camera through Zoom with digi digital audio recordings <clears throat> with a question of whether any of the audio channels that are being communicated through are being recorded in the digital audio recording. <clears throat> and none of this is about jurisprudence or sense making and law. This is just about using technology. not interesting how that could happen and in the event then that uh, such court proceedings could take place are these recordings uh, the zoom meetings being recorded <clears throat> when you use zoom and you try and record it uh, a little notification will come up in zoom saying this meeting is being recorded to make you aware of this now, this is based on American law, which would require you to have inter-party agreement before you record conversations, which applies in some states in America, but not in all states, but doesn't apply in Ireland. If you're having an inter-party conversation with another person, all you need is one person's approval in order to record that conversation. <clears throat> but irrespective of that, while within Zoom, in their technology, uh, if I press a button to record, the other party or parties to the Zoom meeting will be made aware of that fact. And if I stop the recording, they'll be made of the aware of the fact with an audio message to say that it's being, the recording has been, um, has ceased. H however, I, I can just use a screen recorder like Camtasia to record the event anyway, and a third party won't know. So that came to my attention, the relevance of this. I think it might have been <coughs> yesterday, Friday, I think so. Uh, I saw an article in the news about a lecturer in um, University College Dublin, um, and the article was about the fact that a video seen by the Irish Times uh, of a, a, a lecture he had had with his students through Zoom, in which it is alleged that he told them, he lacerated the students, basically criticizing them for their, their generalized incapacity to even read academic material. And uh, I suppose he was lashing out at them. And then there was furore and um, he's saying he was lynched and all the rest and but there was a an excerpt with um, uh, excerpts from what he allegedly said during this but they're in quotation marks so by definition they're verbatim uh, according to the standards of journalism they can be taken as the verbatim, the verbatim words used by this lecture on this recorded video. And it led me to ask the question about um, the legal, moral and ethical elements of whoever recorded that meeting and the Irish Times publishing this, and what are the implications and what does this say about journalism? Um, 
So the first thing is, I wonder who recorded the meeting. Was it recorded as part of the protocol within UCD that all perhaps lectures are recorded for dissemination to students who may not be, have been in a position to avail of the meeting at that time? The idea of what's called asynchronous learning, where somebody can watch the learning material asynchronously from when it's delivered, which I think is a magnificent idea and suits the contemporary reality that we have and it's one of the wonderful aspects of technology. For many reasons, people may not be free to attend, they may have other demands in their lives or in often their disposition and availability, their emotional availability, their um, perceptual availability, their motivation, all the rest at that time may not do it. Maybe they're sort of people who are night hawks and they like to learn at night and if that can be facilitated that's great. So that would give me one understanding where the recording was recorded deliberately as part of a plan. Um, then there's the question of was it recorded not intentionally or an individual recorded, how could that have taken place without everybody else knowing about it through the Zoom interface? And then thirdly, whether someone intentionally recorded that using a screen recorder, for example, like Camtasia, which is what I would have had experience of doing, and have done this, not just in that, but it's a screen recorder. Anything that's happened on the screen, you can record it. Um, I'm thinking I could probably record the, such content on my screen recorder uh, within the uh, iPad OS environment on my iPad anyway as well. And if somebody did that, say, surreptitiously, and then this information was handed out to whatever journalist in the Irish Times, and then the editorial staff in the Irish Times had to decide to publish this. But what I did also think was interesting is what the excerpt that's published is, is, is published in such a way as to highlight the um, controversial elements of what this lecture said. However, it's an excerpt. It's, you know, at most a couple of minutes at most, uh, maybe even a minute and a half of a content which went on for a longer period of time. So what I was wondering about is, so first of all, was it legally incorrect? I think if the participant in the meeting, the Zoom meeting, was a participant in the meeting, then in my understanding of the law, it would have been perfectly legally valid for them to make a recording in the same way. And I keep telling people, if you don't agree with me about that, just go back and analyze the Sergeant McCabe recordings. Remember, remember Sergeant McCabe back in 2014 was written off. He was about, I suppose, he was a sliver of being destroyed forever. Um, you, you remember that the guy, whatever his name is, Callanan, the disgraced ex-chief, whatever, bottle washer guard, um, calling two men himself and John Wilson, McCabe and John Wilson, disgusting. There's only two, two members of the force out of 12,000 guards think there's something wrong, so they were disgusting. Anyway, um, but separately, when uh, the then confidential um, recipient, so I'm trying to remember his name, Oliver. Helen. No, Oliver? No, he, he come to me, anyway look him up, the confidential recipient. So I was down in Ennis, <coughs> walking around the streets of Ennis, and I went in for a uh, cup of tea and a, a, a toasted sandwich. And I was listening to this on the radio. I heard Michael Clifford and um, Matt Cooper discuss this on the Matt Cooper, The Last Word radio program. And they were discussing Oliver, his name of the company, his press conference and uh, the press release that he put out there saying that Morris McCabe had acted unlawfully by recording the conversation that he had had with uh, this confidential recipient. And he cited the, the Gubu case. The, he said his constitutional rights of privacy were breached. And he relied on, on a, a case which related, as it turns out, to a third party recording. That's in other words, if I'm talk, if A is talking to B, and C records that conversation. That's the third part of recording. If A is talking to B, and either A or B, or A and B, record a conversation. That's inter-party recording. So Oliver, his name will come to me. God, how do Callanan. I forget? No, Callanan is the guard. Anyway, and, and of course, so um, Michael, 
Clifford and Matt Cooper, uh, they discussed this in this program. And or what it was interesting, I was listening to this because they seemed to think that this was really bad form. They didn't say it was illegal, but they didn't disagree with the confidential recipient. They actually bought into the idea that McCabe had acted unlawfully and that um, it was really an underhand thing to do. And at the time I interviewed it, talked to a lot of people about this, and 99 people out of 100 believed that it was illegal to do a recording between an inter-party recording. They actually believed it was illegal. And uh, I suppose because of something that happened a number of years ago whereby um, a complaint made to the barrister's professional tribunal about professional misconduct by a barrister, whereby a phone call made by a person to a barrister was recorded by that person and the, ba the barrister uh, lacerated this individual in a very unprofessional way. When the complaint was lodged, the barrister <coughs> tried to hide behind the fact of claiming that this was illegal. So Kieran Wood, who is then the Legal Affairs, I think, uh, editor in the Sunday Business Post, had su posted some material. So I went off and I researched this. It's to do with the Telecommun Telecommunication Packets Act, Package Act, Data Packets, Data Telecommunications Data Packets Act. And there were two periods, I think it was um, 1987 and then 1997, something like 10 years apart. And in the earlier uh, act, it required the approval of two parties to an inter-party conversation that they both had to agree for the recording to be for the recording to be legal, and um, or to allow it, for it to be legal to make the recording. Ten years later, that was modified to say either or. So both and was modified to either or. So that was the that is the existing law in Ireland at the moment, and. Uh, uh, the Sunday after the confidential recipient, his name has come to me, Oliver. God. It was interesting when I looked at his, um, I went and I downloaded the, his press release, I think as a PDF, probably through the Cork Examiner, the examiner.ie website. And this, I think he's a solicitor originally, but he had numbers of, of letters after his name, you know, qualifications and he seemed to have been a barrister in this country and a barrister in another country. Geez, he'd more he'd more letters after his name than there was in the alphabet. And of course that was sorry, the whole act of this here was he was presenting himself as something with huge levels of credibility. He was appointed in the um I think probably by Alan Shatter. I believe he was a contributor to Alan Shatter's election campaign at the time, a Finnegale supporter. At the time I researched him and I'd seen heavy commendations by both Shatter and um, Enda Kenny, the then Taoiseach, saying this was a great guy. So when he tried to nail Maurice McCabe, he was not just nailing him with a reference to a case. The reference itself was incorrect, by the way. And the other thing is if he was 1% of the lawyer which he was presenting himself as being, he would have known that. So he would, he would I can confidently say that if he was the person that they claimed he was for the reason that they appointed him. He would have been fully cognizant of the fact that he was disingenuously misleading the public. That he knew, I, he either was incompetent and shouldn't be in the job, or else he is competent and he knows that he was lying. He was just lying. He, you know, he was wrong and he, he just tried to mislead people. I mean, I did leave a message in his, in his company's office, asked him to contact me about this, to seek clarity. Now, the following Sunday, there was an article in the uh, Independent by um, a lecturer in, in uh, UCD who was a digital rights expert. Again, just can't remember his name offhand. Again, I wrote to him about this. And he, again, had posted the very same reference material to which I had collected and collated information before then. Now, it's interesting because I've tried to get that program, the recording of that program, from the last, from L, uh, whatever you call it, Today FM, I think it was, the last word, a number of years ago, I tried to look for it, because this stuff must be stored somewhere, but nobody ever got back to me about it. Um, so, uh, what I'm saying, that's, I might have a real interest in this idea of inter-party inter recording stuff. But I just thought it was interesting, so this has now come in with this um, lecture in UCD, 
So we have the Irish Times, that's the paper of record. We have a journalist in the Irish Times supervised by an editorial system. So anything that is printed there has passed by, let's say, the legal eyes of, uh, of the Irish Times. And they have published verbatim. So verbatim would mean that there must be, by definition, a recording of the words that were printed to prove that they actually were said in the first place. And the question is, who made the recording? So was it legal? Well, that'll depend on whether it was third party uh, involvement or not, or was it inter-party? Um, but the, so a couple of aspects of that interest me, some, some supportive of what happened, some questioning what happened. But I do ask myself the question is that the Irish Times have basically released just a small excerpt. Um, so all we get is a window, like a little window of opportunity into what was going on in that lecture, but only a window. Uh, I, I then challenge the integrity of the philosophical process of thinking within the Irish Times in this regard that, um, I mean, I think the correct thing would have been to put the excerpt, lay, let's say, the charge against this individual. And the appropriate thing then would have been to put a copy of the meeting in a public place which could then be referenced by an interested or curious reader in order that the reader might inform himself of the landscape and context of this conversation that took place. So for example today, like this is a beautiful landscape, you know, just if you, if I just move this around here and look at that blue, look at that sky. So I'm sitting here on the edge of the edge of reason, maybe, on the edge of the Atlantic coast here in uh, Porto Arthur here in Guidor, Bunbeg, Derry Beg, gorgeous. So there's a context within which I'm speaking. I'm not speaking to you from the Gulag archipelago in the middle of winter. So everything, things are about context, and particularly in this relationship, this lecture is lacerating, let's say, the snowflake generation. He's putting it up to him saying, you know, you're a crowd of wasters, you don't know what you're at, and, you know, I don't, he said things like that, I don't know who'd employ you, etc. <laughs> but the other thing that interests me is that, okay, so, um, is it fair and is this responsible journalism not to print what they did, but to fail to um, provide the reference material. Like if you're writing a book and you make a point somewhere, you put in your Harvard referencing system, whatever you, you say where you got the material, you, and you enable the reader, you know, the independent ad used to always say, you know, before you make up your mind, open it. And um, if the Irish Times, the paper of record, went to the trouble of exposing this lecture, let's say, using recorded material, and we, at this point in time, I don't know where, the, um, where it came from, you know, the genesis of this recording was whether it was done legally or otherwise but I put it in terms of responsible journalism they should have put a reference to the overall uh, the original total recording so we might see the context um, I consider this so the question is is this just sensationalist journalism is this what the Irish Times are now doing is it or are they just are they just into sensationalism or is this responsible journalism I would like to think that the, uh, the idea behind it was to have a discussion about what's going on in Irish education, and that's the thing I'd like to come to now. I said, wow, this is great. It doesn't matter to me what was said. That's not the prime issue. The prime issue is, for everybody who's watching this, if anybody's watching it, Oliver when Connelly. Uh, my, my research assistant here tells me it's Oliver Connolly. Oliver Connolly. Um, sorry, Oliver Connolly was the, the confidential recipient. Um, gorgeous oranges. From Mickey's Gallagher's um, supermarket here in Guido. Bit of a plug there. But um, uh, so I'm, where, was I, where was I thinking about the. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering. Like when I went to school, my parents had no idea what was happening in my classroom. When my kids went to school, I have no idea what went on in their classroom. I actually don't have any idea. Like if my kids had told me, if I told my parents, maybe they would, but then. So 
the actual classroom was almost like it's like a bit of a confessional stuff happens there but there's nobody in the outside really knows what happens every now and then the kigara comes in I had a conversation with someone yesterday about their memory of going to school. It took place in a Zoom conversation. We have a tea and chat session. We have with the through the school bowl men sit here in Donegal. We have a tea and chat every Monday and a Friday morning. An open tea and chat session from half ten in the morning till twelve noon. So people from sheds anywhere in the world, our friends or anybody who's into coming in just for a tea and a chat. But a lot of it related to um, actually started with this conversation. We talked about things that happened in school and people have. Yeah, you know, long memories about the Sally Rod and, the, you know, physical abuse and all the rest in schools, etc. But there was no way of knowing what went on in that school. So they were saying when the Kigari used to come into school, the best students of the class would all be placed up at the top by the teacher in preparation and the dunces would be left in the bottom. And the Kigari would obviously ask questions of the boys in the front of the class and everybody was signed off as perfect education system, great, great, great. And I pointed out to them that the Kigari, by definition, would in the past have been one of those teachers who had done exactly the same for the Kigari before them. So everybody maintained the illusion of the facade, of the pretense that there was education actually going on in the school of a certain level. Meanwhile, the dunces at the back of the class and some of whom were probably very bright and just didn't play the game. But so the assessment of what was going on was, let's say, at best, irrelevant. Um, so all of a sudden now, what I'm saying is now all of a sudden, and really because of technology, it is possible to know what's going on inside the classroom. And that's interesting. So I'm just thinking back in maybe 2008, when I was still lecturing, one of the mature students in my class, a super guy, Mark was his name, great guy. You know, the great thing about the mature students, most of them, almost without exception, they were there because they chose to be there, maybe second chance learners, etc. But he came to me, he used to drive up and down to Dundalk from Cavan, so maybe it was an hour, an hour and a half journey every day. So he said to me, came to me and said, do you mind if I record your lecture? Because uh, I could listen to it on the way home in the car and reflect on it. I was thinking, I don't know why anybody would want to listen to me twice. But I said, I, I absolutely do mind. Not that you're recording me, but I mind that you're sitting up at the back of the class recording me when you're getting a bad recording. So I'd prefer if you come up to the front of the class or else put the recorder up in front of me so you pick up the best audio you can pick up. Because I think it's a wonderful idea that you'd review anything um, looking back on your way in the car. I think that's a fantastic idea of being able to drive and listen to this stuff again and reflect on it like a podcast. Remember, this is back in 2007, 2008. This, really, this is a real bright student, real good guy. And, um, and uh, you know, and of course, I appreciated the courtesy he showed me, but it was more important. I was saying, look, we should, uh, this is about your learning. It's about the opportunity to relearn. But I also was talking to a lovely guy who's a technology, um, a technology specialist in... Uh, in a learning technologist specialist in Trinity in Dublin. Great guy, and we used to talk about this. And at his time, his design objective was to have the lectures that he, that he, rec that he would set up recording for the lectures. He would try and say, at, at 20 minutes after the lecture, I want to have them up online, which meant there was no, si there was no opportunity for him to post-process or post-edit any of the presentation. In the same way, for me, what I'm doing is ex tempore, which as Mary tells me is in the moment. Everything I'm doing here is it's not scripted. Um, so if a lecture uh, has a cadence and a flow to it, um, it's a completely different lecture done, for example, if a lecture was scripted or post-edited and post-produced or studio produced. So for example, an hour of, uh, of a lecture which was pre-planned um, shot with care and attention and you know multiple cuts and multiple takes etc a completely different output done um, a free-flowing extempore lecture just that happens in the moment and is, is then edited uh, sort of simply topped and tailed and put up 20 minutes later in the same day, if you take any of the artists that you might listen to uh, a, a recording by them done in the studio and then just throw an old guitar at them and let them play with no protection, no, geez, you, you, you'd probably never listen to them again in a lot of cases. Uh, and I just, we talked at that time, he and I talked about, so what are the advantages? The advantages of a 20-minute 
of a lecture being put up 20 minutes later is of massive advantage to students. They have instant access to the material. Let's say somebody was sick or they couldn't make it on the day or something happens at home or they missed the bus or they were late or whatever it is, that they wouldn't be left behind. If on the other hand, the lecturer had to take that lecture and then review it again and edit it, I mean, the, the, if you had an hour's lecture and you had to review it, that's another hour that you have to edit and post-produce it. There could be 10 hours post-production on that. And, that, and then you mightn't have time to do it for a week, so it could be two or three weeks before it ever go up. So if the advantage of instantaneous, almost spontaneous and reusable learning object material, or else this material that might come out weeks later when probably lost its impact. Um, so what are the latitudes that are required to play into that? If you're going to adjudicate um, on, on a lecture's performance based on this in-the-moment um, uh, sort of uh, informal reality that is, that's what happens in lectures. Like there's sometimes there's a good lecture and sometimes there's a bad lecture, there's no guarantees and that doesn't just depend on the quality of the lecture, it often has to do with the ambience and what's happening on the day in the room. I mean things happen in the room on a day, sometimes you do a lecture and it feels like you're pushing a ball uphill all the time or a stone, some days it just flows like magic. Um, and it might depend on the topic, it might depend on the stuckness of the individuals, it might depend on um, the particularities of the character of lectures. I mean, there's all sorts of lectures do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Um, and But the interesting thing was, wow, we know the opportunity to actually go inside a room and see what's happening. And what will that do to the experience? So, for example, if lectures were feeling that they're, everything they're doing has been poured over by somebody examining every little moment, will they, you know, like in medicine, will they practice de vet defensive education, defensive medicine? In other words, make sure you do nothing wrong, never get caught out. And surely the whole idea in university learning is that you experience lots of different madnesses, you know, lots of different crazy stuff that open your mind to possibility, to challenge, to critical thinking. You shouldn't necessarily agree with everything a lecturer says. In fact, the more things you... But you should learn the process of maybe... Um, what is it uh, Charles Handy talks about and Auntie DeMello talks about? Don't believe what I say. Take what I say, ingest it, digest it, reflect on it, regurgitate it, look at it. If you like it then it's yours you have made it yours do not believe it and in my view that's what lecturing should all be about and particularly now when you can take material that's given to your lectures you can go and cross-reference this yourself and if you if you come in then you should actually stand up and say i disagree with you and here's my reason so now you're involved in the argument in the process of argument the thesis the perspective the antithesis the opposite perspective and supported by relevant arguments, and the synthesis, the learning by the whole group of a better way of, 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 of knowledge based on the merits of the content itself, not based on I'm the God, the lecturer, and you're a poor student, what would you know? But th this is, to me, I just, when I saw this yesterday by this lecture, and I don't know anything about the guy, it doesn't interest me, and I see comments online, there's a real lazy lecture and all sorts of other things, and there was other comments talking about him, you know, his financial circumstances and all this. Now, I know the guy is, seems to be 65 years of age. I'm 65, and I just presume, hopefully he's at an age where he doesn't give a fuck. That it doesn't matter to him because at the end of the day, he's going to get his pension and all the rest. No, he, he's, he's angry. he says he's been hatcheted and all the rest. But I still think, irrespective of the arguments, I think they're very strong arguments. You should be putting it out there. What about young people? He's basically saying you have this... Uh, the tyranny of merit stuff that Michael Sandel is writing about and that Tom Collins is writing in the paper about the, the hubris of those who achieve, saying that we got here because how brilliant we are and the expectation that those who'd never had the opportunity to achieve that should blame themselves for being stupid. Um, so I suppose he's challenging this. I mean, how do you guys get to college? And, you know, you're all here because your mothers and your fathers and the state are paying fees and all the rest, but you just can't read and all the rest. But the fact that people would end up feeling really hurt about this. I mean, we really have a generation of people who, you know, they're not like our fathers and grandfathers who, you know, went through wars or, or people in various parts of the world. Like if you were living in Aleppo right now, I don't think you'd be really concerned about whether the lecturer said you did, couldn't read or something. Um, 
So there's the question of, you know, whether this generation can take a challenge. Now, I mean, this guy shouldn't have been allowed what he said, what he said, unless he accepts some student coming back and maybe challenging him about his performance or maybe arguing their perspective. Then I think real education would be happening. Um, but I just wonder what people feel about that, that idea. Like the technology is now there. I'm sitting down here on a beach ring. I'm experimenting. We're doing this experiment for me. I'm experimenting with me little wireless go, uh, uh, trans wireless transmitter. My little, there's two transmitters in the pack. That's my wireless go two. So I'm wearing one of these. It's, so it's, it's, it's uh, recording wirelessly onto the channel. I haven't done this with this mix and a GoPro 9. It's going in through the analog output of my receiver. Um, if I was doing it into, say, an iPhone, I could have come kept it all digital, but back through an, an, an analog output through a 3.5 millimeter stereo jack into a media mod and a GoPro 9. And I'm interested in what will it come out like. I'm interested in whether uh, one will it record the audio. Um, and then the other thing is I'm interested in uh, whether there'll be wind noise or whatever, what quality of audio is there. Um, so I just, I mean, it's all about education. So the question really is the fact that you with know, technology nowadays, um, the uh, almost, there's so many devices which can record audio, for example, plus device that can call video, that even young school children say you had an audio device with them in secondary, certainly in secondary school and absolutely in the third level, that uh, anybody can be recording anything at any time. And again, under the Irish law, if you're a participant in a, in a dialogue, you can record. And by the way, I, I think that's probably one of the most important rights in our society. I think the, this thing that, let's say I have a conversation with you and I say something to you. And uh, then we go to court and there's a dispute over what either of us said. If I produce a recording or if you produce a recording, then the recording is friendly, or it's, it's certainly not favorable to anybody. The recording itself is simply a recording of what was said. So in those sense, this idea of facts being friendly applies there. Really, facts are neutral. They're just saying, here's what happened. And the intonation of what was said, etc., is carried as well as, you know, so this other level of intelligence over and above the words that were used, the intonation gives a further level of insight into the context. And if there's video, it gives an other layer as well to the tone, not only to the tonality, but the, maybe the disposition of, the, of what is said between people, which is a lot richer than, say, a transcript of what people say. Um, but if you and I have had a conversation and, let's say, I deny what you said, but we both know what you said, now, you can say, well, maybe you can't remember. Well, again, therefore, the recording. We don't need to remember if the recording's there. This recording is here, so whatever I'm saying, I'm saying. I, in the future, may have a different memory of what I've said. I may look back on what I said, and I, I said, well, I was trying to say something different. That's true, but this is what I'm saying. I'm saying what I'm saying. Um, so it seems to me that, let's say it was illegal for me to record this, as it was, say, back in 1987, or as it is in some of the states in America. So we go to court, let's say it's a contractual issue, and we're disagreeing on an agreement we made verbally. Um, and we're in the business of relying on our memory. But let's say, for example, I had the capacity to have a photographic memory, just and I can remember verbatim. You know, it's like young, uh, my, my, one of my heroes, Tesla, you know, said about him when, when he grew up in Serbia, and he was able to, he was able to remember verbatim Shakespeare when he was five, you know. So let's say I had that capacity to just have that clarity that I could repeat ad nauseum stuff that was said. And let's say I had a recognition of high level of accuracy for that. And I'm a dispute with you, and you're, let's say, at best a bit forgetful. The chances are that my um, uh, take on events or my recall would be accepted as being more trustworthy than yours. Let's say this is a case of a civil law case where the decision is made on the balance of probabilities as against a criminal case where decisions are made on the basis of beyond reasonable doubt. So I tell a story, contractual, civil law, judge me, I'm believable because I appear to have a good memory. You're not believable because your memory is just not so good as mine. And I keep thinking, at all times, the recording, 
would establish what actually was said. So it removes it away from the domain of what you think of me or what I think of you or whether people think I'm a bright guy or a good guy or a bad guy. Or good. It is what it is because it's a recording. So what on earth can anybody argue is the logic of me having a digital recorder which is better than the most calibrated brain that I could ever have in terms of recording stuff. It's simply an id memoir. So when all these guys write these notes, an id memoir, I write down my id memoir of what happened concurrently in the conversation. And this sort of material is given weight in courts of law when just press the bloody button and record it and we don't need the aid memoir or whether I spelled or missed a word and remember the preposition here the preposition there was it Roger Casement was hung for a comma the placement of a comma in a sentence so when I say something the inflection I use when you write it down might have a comma placed where I never intended to place it um, so I, I have a difficulty when anybody has a problem with anybody recording anything so I think I need to take responsibility for things I say. If I say something and those utterances come out of my mouth, I need to take ownership of the fact that I control my vocal cords and it's out. Okay, if I've got Tourette's, that's a condition. But even the person with Tourette's made the noises, utterances that they made. And too many arguments in life are spent about what was actually said as against the merit of what was said, um, whether what was said represented the intentionality of the speaker. So, for example, if I say something and you hold, you play it back to me, I may then seek to represent what I said in light of maybe one mature reflection, as in, uh, what do you call your man? Mature reflection, Lenahan. And uh, upon mature reflection, I decided that uh, you have the recording, by the way, in Lenin's case, the mature reflection came because that research student had a recording, funny enough. So, um, this quotation that you get a lot more done with a kind word and a gun than a kind word alone, a reference to Al Capone um, in terms of managing change. So, I said, the student who challenged the version that was then presented by Lenin, I think when he was going for the presidential position, uh, was changed, his mature reflection, let's say, was coloured by the fact that um, the guy said, well, I actually have a tape recording um, of this. It brings me back a little memory with uh, Mervyn Taylor. So anybody who remembers Swervin Mervyn Taylor, Labour, you know, intellectual uh, leader of change in terms of the first minister for equality in Ireland. He spoke very, very you know, I suppose authoritatively is the way I would see him. And uh, a couple of days before the divorce referendum, I think probably the second referendum, maybe in 1995, he was on a Marion Finucane radio program. So this the guy is the first, he's the champion of equality. Now equality means, uh, sorry, equality means if A is equal to B, then B is equal to A. It's a bidirectional um, function. Uh, the, you know, it's a equals B, therefore B equals A. It's not that A equals B and B is bigger than A. Neither is bigger than the other. Now, sorry, in gender terms, that means if men equals women, women equals men. So equality, the road for, to equality is, is a road which is travelled in both directions. Um, Mervyn Taylor and the rest of the equality uh, ideology people apparently, in my view, seem to have only seen it as a singular direction. We must work to make women equal to men. But if the circumstances turn out that men are uh, discriminated against and they're in an unequal situation compared to women, well, we don't regard that as relevant. And therefore, so, therefore it's not equality. Anyway, the point about it is he was asked by Marion Finucane about um, the parenting of children post-separation. So he said, Mervyn Taylor said, except in exceptional circumstances, young p children in particular should be in the sole custody of a mother. And I was listening to this, Jesus, I was in absolute shock because obviously that wasn't my lived reality at the time. I, at that stage, was a couple of years, a number of years, I think, into practicing shared and equal parenting. Much against the cultural receptivity and the acceptance of the other parent and whatever, and society in general. 
And I was thinking to myself, how could a Minister for Equality affect a divorce referendum by such an inequitable and discriminatory statement? So at that time, I managed to find a playback on the programme. I recorded it on, in a cassette tape, if you remember cassette tapes. And then I transcribed what he wrote. So a number of months after the referendum was passed or whatever, uh, there was a meeting with um, Parental Equality and Mervyn Taylor in his office, which was in Merrion Street, in um, the government buildings in Merrion Street in Dublin. And uh, interesting, when I went to university, I attended University College Dublin in the engineering school, but the engineering school was in the same buildings before they were taken over by the government. So Mervyn Taylor met us in an office which had been occupied by one of my professors during um, my college years. So it was interesting to revisit this space. So Mervyn Taylor sat around the room with all his acolytes, his experts, his senior civil servants. And I said to him, we have a difficulty with the inequitable position that you took on the Marion Finucane programme prior to the elect, the referendum, seeking uh, obviously to influence the thing, but using very discriminatory language. And he said, I never said that. I never said that. I'm a solicitor. We didn't say he was a solicitor, but obviously, this is Mervyn Taylor, a very successful solicitor, a minister, an, an acclaimed minister, was seen by everybody to be the guiding light of change and equity and equality and everything else. I never said those words. And I said to him, well, I love this. This was like Edward G. Robinson in the movie he had with Steve McQueen about the card playing. And I said, you know, I got this guy. I got him. He's lying. I said, no, you did say it. So he kept on saying, no, nope, I didn't say it. No, nope, didn't say it. And, you know, all his acolytes were there and they're looking up to him and saying, There's, he's our man, he's the minister, he's after telling you, he's the king. And I said, well, I have a, the difficulty here is I have a recording of the, you know, I said to him, I have a transcript of what you wrote. So I handed over, there's the transcript. And I said, uh, just in case of doubt, I said, there's a copy of the recording. And I said, now we're going to force the conversation to face the truth, which is he'd said this stuff. He had lied, no, okay, he had denied he said it. So is that a lie? Is it an untruth? Is it a falsehood? Did he simply forget? So I could, well, there's endless possibilities. But until I gave evidence that he had actually said it, the waiting of the table by an independent listener He's there with his acolytes, the experts, the gods, the powerful. He would be considered to be right. I'm the nobody on this side of the table. The only difficulty is I have evidence to what actually happened. So if you jump forward to the Morris McCabe thing, there's Morris McCabe, two out of 12,000 guards. Only two guys are asking awkward questions according to Callanan. So they're disgusting. The problem is Oliver Connolly then says, you know, McCabe is unlawful, and then they put him down, try to wipe him out. Now, in 2021, to my knowledge, Morris McCabe is five million richer, paid for out of taxpayers' money for the misconduct of the state in abusing him. And this money then earned by, earned for him by Michael McDowell. Okay, and nobody don't know how much, whether hundreds of thousands of millions was paid to McDowell in legal fees, I have no idea. All this taps up by taxpayers, ordinary people doing a day's work. Um, money that could be spent on raising children, supporting old people, supporting disability, all these other things. This is spent on this thing by a guy, Michael McDowell, who himself was the Minister for Justice during the period that Morris Callanan was coming on th up through the ranks. The Gardaí, the, the environment in which Morris McCabe was fermented and honed his skills, the skills that got him to behave in the way he did, um, and almost destroy Morris McCabe, now produce an outcome where the state pay Morris McCabe five million, and then we don't hear from Morris McCabe again. So really, Morris McCabe is now silent, and the conversation can be moved on. Um, to go back to, so go way back here, there's no five million, nobody gave me five million. So we're there with, with them, Mervyn Taylor, there's a couple of us, the little people here, but we have the data. And Mervyn Taylor has just claimed the, the very opposite. I never said those things. And I said, it's a bit like that poker game with Edward G. Robinson and, and McQueen. McQueen has him. He says, there you are, I have you. And I never realised what had come next. Your man just stood there and in the master stroke of the masturbation of reality, 
he just turned around and said, I must have meant something different. <laughs> With his deadpan face, he said that. And then the acolyte said, the minister must have said something different. It was like, uh, it was like some sort of Catholic religion thing. Like, you know what I mean? It was like a mea culpa, mea culpa. And I just thought the world would swallow me up. I just thought, the concept of reality, the concept of factual reality, and someone that you have any sense of shame, accountability, truth, or anything, never entered the room. He just sailed past the truth as if it didn't exist. And it was a salutary lesson to me for having the data, having the facts, and being correct is irrelevant. It's irrelevant when you're in a power play. In a power play, he who has the gold rules. The rest is just an illusion. It's called the illusion of democracy. And uh, I thank God I can laugh about it now because I realize I'm powerless. I look up in the sky and I look at this magical sun and I thank God for its existence. And if there isn't a God, whoever's be, whoever gave me the idea that there might be something, as my father said to me, my late father said to me, all I know, son, is it's a lot bigger than me. And the more I live, I realize it's a lot bigger than me. And my mother used to say it to me, the day you get better is the day you die. And so I do think that while I'm deeply, righteously angered about this fundamental wrongdoing, because I think that if you think about the idea of what's good for society and good for the public service and all the rest, I think Mervyn Taylor on that day did a great disservice to the concept of public service. I think he did a great disservice to the concept of truth and integrity. And I think the acolytes who sat beside him, those civil servants who were on a pensionable grade in the civil servants, uh, who probably had done well in school and in college or whatever, is to get those jobs, but basically their moral fiber just was non-existent. And I think when we're hit like in the last year with existential fears like COVID, stuff that probably the best of us know nothing about, like I'm an engineer, I'm not a, a sort of um, pharmacologist or virologist or anything, I don't, I don't know the dynamics of how they work, but I know that the people who thought they knew what they were, they, did a year ago, constantly realized we haven't a clue what's going on. I really don't know where things are going and all the rest. And I think when we look to our leaders and those in whom we entrust our uh, beliefs um, and our sense of solidarity to work together, when I see activities like Mervyn Taylor, I said, to me, he debased the concept of that which he was supposed to be representing. Did he give a shit? No. Does he care about someone like me? No. Do I have any influence over anybody in relation to that? No. So the only thing that I ended up with was, what was the value of the recording? And I suppose for me always, the value of the recording and at the end of the day has been, it's the only way I could calibrate my own sanity. I mean, without that recording, I think he would have convinced me that he had never said that. He would have convinced me that I was just making this stuff up myself. Uh, and that's been the experience of my life. So I'm just come back. We started this conversation about the guy in UCD, the fact that the Irish Times decided to report uh, and print uh, verbatim ex excerpts of a lecture which had been held through Zoom, um, which then showed him in a light which some people may say is a terrible light, other people might say, geez, it's fair juiced him for challenging those young people. But one of the Irish Times, in my view, irresponsibly in terms of journalism, did not provide the Harvard reference, which was the publish somewhere, the totality of that recording so that we could all watch it. And then the other thing is, what does it mean to education, the fact that people can see inside the uh, inside the lecture room. And that could be, you could see inside the, the room that your kids go to school in. Like, given that we have known, or when we hear now of people's bad experiences in school in the past, um, 
uh, I wonder if parents were able to, let's say there was cameras in the school classrooms so that the teaching of the classes could be monitored for safe protection of the children. And how would that affect everything that's going on? How would that affect our behavior? Again, would we be get into defensive education, like we hear of defensive medicine? Um, and then we would, we have no risk taking. So, uh, like for example, if lecturers were gonna be sacked for saying words like fuck and expletives and things like that, I probably wouldn't have lasted a week lecture. And not because I was being bad mannered to people, but part of my sort of Hiberno-Celtic um, way of expressing myself has lots of, um, let's say, expletives built into them. Now, Bob Geldof, you know, even the Vatican loved him, although that's how he talked. So some people get away with it and some people don't. Um, but in a much other level, I mean, the fact is almost any non-PC comment made by any teacher, lecturer, or mentor anywhere in the world would be just quelled immediately. So we'd have this complete bland equilibrium of stasis, of no change, of nothing going on. Um, so in a way, I, I loved to see this. I, I, what I thought was, you know, I was really sad that the Irish Times just think, actually, we'll just print an old article and fill in a couple of column inches. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they opened up a page and said, let's have a real discussion. Let's actually bring this discussion out. Let's bring it into the media maybe have some of these students come on uh, and have that conversation with that lecture out there. Let's argue the toss about this and let's all inform ourselves one of the concepts, the dilemmas, the difficulties. There's no easy things. I mean, I believe in absolute openness and transparency. And then on the other hand, how can people explore ideas, different views? How do we change from where we are unless we take risks? If we try out something or say things or go a bit left of centre or right of centre and there's no, there's no tolerance, there's no latitude, there's no springiness in possibility, but they were waiting for the Irish Times to pounce and pick on excerpts and choose one position or another. I'm not saying they might hang the lecture one day, they might hang a student the next day, but there's more going on with hanging than there is about investigation. There's more prejudice than there's exploration. Uh, there's more pointedness than there is possibility. Uh, I don't think this is good journalism. Um, Stokes, Paul Stokes, I think is that the guy's name? Dr. Paul Stokes, look him up anyway, if that's the case. Uh, but it's uh, an interesting time. I imagine in the days when, you know, when Newman wrote about universities, environments in Oxford and Cambridge where he talked in his writings about the idea of a university where students would get together and in that milieu and maelstrom of curiosity and possibility and trying out stuff, people would uh, expand their thinking, their critical faculties would kick in, they would construct versions of what they believed based on argument, on trial and possibility. And also, for me, I, I think on magic, um, I just imagine the, the blandness of listening to a lecture space where there's nothing there that might be risky. Uh, so anyway, I just hope, it'll be interesting to see how this recording just comes out on that level. All right. So... Like that, I might say to you at the end of this, uh, you know, I say, does it matter? People think this is a bit of a joke. I've said that, it, that idea that after um, a lifetime of experiences like with those with Mervyn Taylor, all my life, the, the endless people in power, it's always been the same. You record people, they lie about what they say, they pretend they were trying to say something else. They negate the facts when you bring them or they say, well, Actually, that used to be the thing. So they deny they said it. Then when you give them the evidence, they accept they said it, but like your man, they say it, it they meant something else. And then when you keep cornering them in the chess game, they say, well, sure, does it matter anyway? So we end up saying the start, sure, if it doesn't matter, does anything matter? Does, does anything have consequences? And so the, the, the stuff I'm thinking about contemplate now is the sense that I think that our side has lost the concept of shame, monoirahu, the shame. Because shame isn't sort of like going to court and winning a, winning a case against someone. 
It's the sense of when someone knows they did something wrong, that it's shame that controls their reaction. Like, Mervyn Taylor, when he listened to what he said, should have been ashamed. Unless he didn't believe in equality. I mean, if obviously he didn't. If he, if he believed in that women should have con that sole custody of children, look, I mean, it's an opinion. I don't agree with him, but he should have said that. He just shouldn't call himself Minister for Equality. But if he got that, and if he got the fact that he was telling untruths, and then if he tried to say he meant something else without saying what he meant, then he should have been ashamed. I mean, that should have been the... The overwhelming impact on him would be to uh, sense him. And the thought that's coming into my mind to me is the the Republic of Conscience by um, Seamus Heaney. Unfortunately, I don't remember the words of that, but the magic in the words there, he talks about, you know, the humility that leaders should feel to have been granted the wonderful opportunity to represent and act in the best interests of people. Imagine having that, that concept of humility and shame. Yep, I think that's uh, with O'Leary, the rest of them in the grave. Okay.